Hello! Welcome one and all to the season finale of Puppet History! Today we'll be taking an ever-winding look at yet another chapter in the heavy, heavy book we call history, while our guests ruthlessly compete for the coveted title of History Wizard! I'm your beloved host, the Professor. Thank you, thank you, thank you! Oh, Ryan Bergara! Are you ready, pal? Oh, I'm good, man. I'm good to go. Season finale, huh? Yeah, can you believe it? Nothing crazy gonna happen? I mean, it seems like it. I think we made it out of this one with all of our souls and uh, bodies intact. Well, I've heard that before. Oh, special guest, Sarah Robin, our returning champ. Are you ready? I am ready. Professor, you grew a bit. I got big. You're a little bit bigger. But the funny thing is, I'm still just a little guy. That's so true. You are just, <laughs> you have little guy vibes. Also, history wizard. Yeah. That's an upgrade from History Master. I think so. You get magic like powers that let you control history or, or rewrite it in some way? Well, sort of. I think you it's get just, a hat. It's just a hat that oh. he, you just uh, get a hat. Pointy project. pointy hat? Uh, well, no. no. More like a trucker hat that you would find at a gas station, but you know. Okay. There's some not craft not into exactly it. the hat I associate with a wizard, but <laughs> well, it seems like you two are ready to go. Season finale, baby! Let's crack in! Right. Now, to begin, hey, which do you prefer, the cold or the heat? I like the heat a little bit more, but if we're talking about either in extremes, probably the cold. Yeah. Because there's nothing you could do to get less hot other than get naked, but that's frowned upon. Like, the idea of freezing to death is much more appealing to me than, like, dying of heat. I'd be preserved. Yeah. Etc. You look good. Whereas if you get hot, you probably get all bubbly. Yeah, and you know, probably like bloated. animals are more likely to munch on you. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't want them to find my dead, naked, frozen body. Well, our story today takes place in the cold. The very cold. In fact, most of our story is set in the coldest place on Earth. Put a cup of cocoa on. Today we're talking about the race to the bottom, a.k.a. the race to the South Pole. Never heard about this. You never heard about the South Pole? I mean, I've heard about it. I didn't know there was a race to it. Is that where Krampus lives? Well, I guess that would make sense, huh? There's penguins there. Oh, lots of penguins. Oh, and they have a little highway. Oh, Antarctica, that long white streak at the bottom of maps. It's a bit hard to parse thanks to that old son of a bitch, the Mercator projection, but the whole continent is about 1.4 times the size of the US, including Alaska, and is home to 70% of the planet's freshwater, locked away as ice. I mean, not for long. Well, Jesus that's true. Christ, you don't have to. You ever seen the movie Waterworld? Well, you know what? It's important we talk about that. Good for you it for is. reminding people. I'm not saying like, ooh, I'm so excited for all that ice to be water. Waterworld does kick ass though. I'm excited to ride around on ski doos and shoot Dude. people with guns. In 1773, Captain James Cook became the first to cross the Antarctic Circle. While he never spotted land, he noticed rocks and the icebergs floating about, convincing him a continent did exist. Though, as he would put it, quote, I make bold to declare the world will derive no benefit from it. After that, the world was in zero rush to confirm or deny the existence of a useless place. It wasn't until 1820 when Russian Navy Captain Thaddeus von Bellingshausen first spotted actual land, technically becoming the only person in recorded history to discover a new continent, as it was the only one with no native population. Would you eat a penguin? I would not eat a penguin. I don't like eating birds that are in suits. For the next hundred years, some whaling and sealing ships would bop around, but it wasn't until the Sixth International Geographical Congress in 1895 in London that the professional explorers really started stealing glances at our planet's juicy bottom, calling Antarctica, quote, the greatest piece of geographical exploration still to be undertaken. Basically, they were running out of new places to geograph. And yet we still haven't explored most of the ocean. Ah. What is it, like 95% or some shit like that? You wanna go down there? Hell no. I think most of the Do you wanna go down there? No, I'm afraid find, of fish. Find your Don't precious. use that against me. <laughs> <laughs> he will, he's sick. <laughs> That's a message to everybody out there. Do not use that against me. Please don't mail her fish. Oh, I'm gonna do No, mail me fish, but don't put a fish in my bed. That's exactly what I was thinking of doing. Okay, moving right along. Oh, nay, nay. Oh, there. Oh, hey, uh, Elmer Walter. Everything all right? It's Elmer Walter Williams to you, sir. Have you seen my bride, Dorothy Ruth? Uh, no, I haven't. Is today the big day? Yes. And the wedding's in a couple hours. I must be off. Nay, nay, wedding day. <laughs> Guy's kind of a jerk. Anyway. Oops. Sneaky clock, Oh, hey! Is that you, Dorothy Ruth? What? 
Who's, who's Dorothy Ruth? Uh, I mean, it's clearly you. Oh, okay, you found me, Professor. <laughs> oh, wait, hang on a second. I just saw Elmer Walter looking for you. Are you pulling a runaway bride? Yes, yes, but for good reason. I, I, I had a dream last night that my sweet Stanley Melvin, well, he, he wasn't alive, no, but he, he wasn't dead either. He was sort of cosmically betwixt, but, oh, it felt real as rain. I looked into his molasses-covered eyes and nuzzled his molasses-covered mane as I breathed in the sickly sweet scent of molasses. It felt too good to be true. And then I woke up. But I can't quite shake the feeling that he's out there somewhere. So I'm leaping clear off the grid now, and I'm going to find him, even though that means leaving my dimwit fiancé at the altar. I mean, you know, I, I did see the guy drown in molasses. You really think Stanley's alive? I don't know, man! Anyway, I want to shout out today's episode sponsor, NordVPN, for helping me on my journey. I just got a sweet exclusive deal via this link on the screen. Now, while I'm on the run, I need to maintain privacy and protect my online activity. And NordVPN creates an encrypted network that hides my dedicated IP address and keeps nosy Nellies from intercepting my data. Oh, wow. Your NordVPN account sounds like it feels super safe and secure. Uh, duh, Professor. And one NordVPN account protects up to six devices and includes 24-7 customer service support. Well, it sounds like they've got your back. Just like... Yes. Just like my Stan, my Stanley did. It just, you know, just wasn't feeling the same with Elmer Walter. He was always asking me for my bank account information. Well, that's concerning. It, it was sus as hell, but now with my reliable NordVPN, I've got all these amazing cybersecurity tools like NordPass to access all my passwords, Data Breach Scanner to send me alerts if any sensitive information gets exposed, and an encrypted cloud storage app called NordLocker. Best thing is I didn't even have to download a new app on this burner phone to set it up. Well, it looks like you're all set to hit the road. Oh, Professor, this VPN is the fastest on the planet. You can join me, too. Get this exclusive NordVPN deal via the link below for a two-year plan and an additional four extra months. It's risk-free now with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Nice! So, where are you headed? Oh, Professor, you know very well I can't divulge that information. But let's just say... It rhymes with schmergatoff. <laughs> All right, Dorothy Ruth. Well, don't forget a coat and good luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 goodbye. Okay. With the world's ear now trained for news of Antarctica, in August of 1897, Belgian naval officer Adrian Victor Joseph de Gerlash de Gumry set off on an old whaling ship he bought called the Belgica. With him was a crew of 19, speaking five different languages, none more valuable than 25-year-old first mate Raoul Amundsen. Raoul Engelbrecht Grovning Amundsen was born July 16, 1872 in Borg, Norway. At age 15, Amundsen read about Sir John Franklin, a British explorer who had searched the Arctic for a Northwest Passage. Between Franklin and the famous Norwegian Fritjof Nansen, Amundsen became so captivated by Arctic explorers that he began dedicating his whole life to preparing for a similar life in the cold. For instance, by sleeping with his windows open to get used to the frigid Norwegian nights. Damn, that's metal. I tried doing one of those cold plunges recently. I lasted 10 seconds. Well? It was very cold, and well, I was scared I was gonna have a heart attack. Why did you do, <laughs> why did you do this? Well, because apparently it's supposed to be good for uh, anxiety and mental health, and it like, improves circulation. Yeah. All those, you know, woohoo things. I have a good remedy for anxiety. What? Okay, so you get a little blanket, and you get a little tea, and then you watch Wally. <laughs> You know, that does sound pretty good. So that's, that's the Sarah Rubin method. By the time he was 25 and setting off on the Belgica, he'd already been on a seal hunting excursion in the Arctic and lost in the mountains of Norway for days without food. If ever there was someone prepared to thrive in the Antarctic, it was Amundsen. Even still, Amundsen's trip would prove to be a trying one. During a January storm, a man was lost overboard on Amundsen's watch. By February of 1898, the Belgica was repeatedly getting stuck in ice for days at a time. On March 6, the Belgica got stuck in the ice and simply wouldn't budge. This was not the plan. They were not outfitted to stay for the sunless winter. As Amundsen wrote on March 11th, things were, quote, starting to get interesting. 
It's gotta suck to journal when you're so cold. With a little inksicle? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine me like, I can't feel my fucking fingers. <laughs> Let's write about it. <laughs> I wonder if they made any like snowmen on the deck. I don't think they did. <laughs> <laughs> about eight months into the trip on April 1st, Amundsen was brainstorming a solution, which included he and another man spending six weeks looking for an iceberg to winter on, eating penguins and seals for months until the weather turned, then eventually paddling a kayak to Australia. It never would have worked, though the crew did resort to eating seals and penguins to stay alive. Amundsen loved it, writing how one could, quote, take the meat as it is and put it in the pan with a little butter, and you have the most delicious steak you could wish for. Penguins look fatty, so I imagine it would be very tasty. Nice little penguin burger. That sounds mm. awesome. Like, know, yeah, like, I, I'm glad they're not eating each other. If but. we were on a boat together, Sarah, and mm. I died of natural causes. Okay, what kind of boat? Like, like what this kind of, kind of boat. Big okay, boat. like a big ship. Like big a big boat. ship. Oh, okay. We were the last two left, and then Who's I died. Who's the captain? The captain's dead. Well, okay. you're the captain now. Thank yeah, you. we're technically co-captain okay, at that great. point. But then I die. You would eat me, right? What, I... what, what, what did you die of? Because I feel like if you died of like something gross. Worms. Of exposure from the, the, the cold. Okay, or that. I'm probably gonna die too, so is it even worth it? But then you could always, you know, fulfill that lifelong question. What does a human taste like? I don't really have that question. <laughs> Ron, um, that was a test. <laughs> that was a test and she passed. In early 1899, as summer returned in the Southern Hemisphere, the Belgica finally made it back to open water. They hadn't even come close to the South Pole, really. They'd barely even tried. But Amundsen had thrived. As he wrote in his diary, quote, The summer night and the winter night at home are beautiful, but they do not seem as captivating. What the fuck? What? What? Did no one see that? What? Water just tripped on, on me. That scared the shit out of it me. It scared though. the shit out of me. It it got... scared, you scared me because there's a little ghost right there. No, the yeah, my whole shoulder's wet. You got a wet shoulder? Wait, let me touch. I don't feel it. What are you talking about there? <laughs> There's some sort of leak up there, maybe. Okay, okay. Well, oh, I see it. Yeah. Oh, you saw that one, right? <laughs> look at my face, look at my face, look at my face. There's a, yeah, there's some water on his face. There's water on his face, okay. I was like, hey, I see the, oh, he <laughs> got As he wrote in his diary, quote, the summer night and the winter night at home are beautiful, but they do not seem as captivating as this silent cold of the moonlit polar night. It is a marvelous feeling that grabs one. Did God create this whole great area for it to be abandoned and forgotten by humans? No, and again, no, certainly not. As Amundsen sailed his way back north in June of 1899, in the British Isles, another man was planning a trip south. Robert Falcon Scott was born June 6, 1868, in Devonport, England. Cool, cool name. name. Strong name. Strong, strong. Strong name. He sounds like the real name of like a superhero, like yeah. Peter Parker. Yeah. Yeah. Falcon. Falcon. Yes. I've never met anybody with the name Falcon. That's not a nickname, that's his actual birth given actual middle name. birth name, yeah. God damn, that's fucking cool. Scott joined the Navy at age 12, impressing officers with his wits, charisma, and enthusiasm. Chosen to lead an expedition south by the Royal Society and the Royal Geographical Society, Scott and his crew left the UK on July 31st, 1901, establishing winter quarters on Ross Island in February of the following year. Ross Island is uh, down in Antarctica. It's not where a bunch of Rosses live. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> yeah. I love Rachel. No, yeah, I love yeah. That's some friend's humor. I'm yeah. not even reacting to it because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I <guess funny. laughs> On November 2nd, Scott set off with two companions and a sledge pulled by 19 dogs in an attempt to reach the South Pole. The team laid food and supply depots in the snow as they set off so they could carry only what was necessary and still have food for their return trip. By December 30th, Scott and his two companions had made it to 82 degrees, 17 minutes south, but had to turn back due to illness and hunger. Oh, our first question. I was waiting for that one. How far away was Scott's team from the South Pole? A, about 4.6 miles. B, about 46 miles. Or C, about 460 miles. You're just moving the decimal. Yeah, I am. So what? What are you gonna do about it? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, Ryan, what do you got? I, I put B46. Sure. I think it's like enough that it's like, oh, we're kind of fucked, but maybe we could do it. How about you, sir? I put C, and I drew a C, because I thought it was going to be a C dog, but <laughs> he didn't no, do a C, I so. I, like I, I just thought that would be the funniest. Yeah, we'll um, give you a bonus jelly for a little C dog. You there. could do a solo C dog. Solo Z dog. Ar, 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 ar. Yay! <laughs> we love it. It's nice. Well, um, a point to Sarah. Oh, pickles. 
Yes, not all that close, really. Remember, Antarctica is bigger than the USA. And once you're at the coast, you've still got quite the distance to the middle and not a ton of transportation options. Scott's team didn't have experience with dogs and traveling with them proved to be a disaster. What? This dude was like, yeah, just attach dogs to the sled. They'll know what to do. He read the manual. Yeah. Should have watched Balto. Balto fucks. Balto fucks? That's a good movie. I mean, he Is does. that the sequel? <laughs> Balto fucks, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Scott and his two travel mates barely made it back to Ross Island on February 3rd, 1903, having covered 960 miles in 93 days. As Scott wrote, quote, we are as spent as three persons can be. Their ship frozen in ice, Scott and the remaining crew spent another winter in Antarctica, not returning to London until September of 1904, three years after they'd left. The scientific community praised their work, but Scott simply wasn't satisfied. Three years later, Scott was planning another trip to Antarctica, and this time his goal was simple, to be the first man to reach the South Pole. You know what the crazy thing is? He could just be like, I did it. He could have just like, <laughs> I made it. it you want to go check my work? You won't be able to. Yeah. And then that would be like their version of like the people who think the moon landing is fake. Exactly. While it took him a long time to raise money for this second expedition, a crew was surprisingly easy to source. 8,000 people volunteered to risk their lives under Scott's command. Having learned much from his first trip down, Scott devised a new plan to actually achieve the pole. Ooh, what was Scott's plan? A, same as the last time, but double the dogs and double the men. Shit, he double dog dared himself. <laughs> B, training polar bears to pull the sledges. No way. Or C, unused technology and horses. God, I wish it was the polar bear one. They're fucking vicious polar bears. They're considered hyper carnivores. Yeah, they're the cool. most violent bear by a wide margin, I feel You like. ever see those guys just go into town on a penguin? Yeah, and they're just covered in blood because yeah. their white fur just soaks yeah. it up. It's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what do you got? I did just A, double dog bear. He sure. doubled him up. Sure. Uh, Sarah, how about you? I also said A because he doesn't seem very bright. Whoa! So <laughs> I feel like he was just like, more. Okay, well I think we're gonna find out via the magic of theater. Oh, by the way, are you guys getting chilly? God. <laughs> yes, it's cold, Professor. I'm chilly. Are you chilly? Well, I'm you got a nice chilly. jacket. Well, maybe it's just the story, or I don't know if there's a draft in here, but whew, I gotta bundle up. All right, I'll see you guys in a bit. Whoa! Well, uh, Eureka! With this plan, I shall surely make it to the South Pole. Wow, how exciting. What you got in store for us, Commander Scott? Okay, so dogs were a real pain last time, so I'm done with dogs. You, well, I mean, you didn't spend any of these last six years learning wow. about dogs? <laughs> I don't need to. I've got a better plan. Experimental motor sledges that have never been used ever before. Okay, cool, but uh, what if those don't work? <laughs> Thought of that. That's why we're bringing horses. Ho horses? They'll sink straight into the snow. <laughs> Not after we strap them into snowshoes. Okay, wh what about when we get to Bairdmore Glacier and we have to climb like three kilometers? Are those horses gonna pull the sledges up that? No, of course not. Okay, we will be carrying the sledges up the glacier. Now who's excited for the best years of their lives? We're all going to die. This guy's, uh, he's got that big old dunce cap on his head. <laughs> they let anybody on a ship these days. Fun to put shoes on a, on a horse, though. That is a good idea, yeah. A snowshoe on a horse. That is fun. Oh! Whoa! Oh. Whoa! <laughs> oh, that's better. I'm nice and snuggly now. Oh my god, you look so cute. I'm kind of giving Ikea monkey vibes, huh? <laughs> a little bit. You look more human than ever, in a way. Like, Thank you. It, Thank it's, you. it looks like you have muscles. I do? I mean, I do have muscles. <laughs> It also looks very tied up on your neck like that one photo of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He does look a lot like Bernie Sanders. I am once again rewarding you a history point. <laughs> there it is. That's what I was fishing for. Uh, points to neither of you. Oh. Sorry about that. That's fine. Well, with the benefit of hindsight, the plan sounds bonkers, but Scott was trying to do something that had never been done before. On June 15th, 1910, a week and a half after his 42nd birthday, Scott and his crew set off from Cardiff, Wales. During the journey south, storms claimed some of their equipment, like horses and coal. 
during one storm, a dog named Osman was swept overboard by a giant wave. Oh. But the next wave washed him back on board. Yay! Yay! Cool. <laughs> That's good. That's, That's good. so funny. That's oh fun. God. That dog must have been traumatized. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Finally, on January 4th, 1911, Scott and his crew anchored in the ice at McMurdo Sound. Two of the motorized sledges were immediately put to work, hauling equipment from the ship to camp. But the third and largest sledge immediately broke through the ice and sank 60 fathoms into the sea. It took two weeks for the men to erect their 1,250 square foot base camp. The seaweed-lined, basically single-room space wasn't exactly cozy, but it was home. As all the pieces fell into place for his trek to the pole, Scott suddenly received some upsetting news. Uh-oh. What was the bad news? A. They were not alone. B. The other two sledges had also broken through the ice. Or C. Scott's wife and son were dead. I'm ready. Put A. They're not alone. Okay. Because it sounds like the start of a horror film. Yeah, right. I like that. Um, I put A, they're not alone because the title of the episode is The Race to the South Pole. Oh, interesting. That's a good, that's So that was a context clue. Solid, a, solid a logic. Good point of reasoning there. A jelly bean for both of you. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Yes, as John Carpenter knows, the worst thing that can happen when you think you're alone in Antarctica is not being alone in Antarctica. Unfortunately for Scott, this was no alien. No, it was Roald Amundsen. Amundsen had landed in the Bay of Wales, a full 70 miles to the south. This was a total surprise. Scott had planned for a deliberate, scientific journey to the pole, but Amundsen's presence suddenly changed things. Scott's men were pretty upset that some Norwegian punk was trying to beat them in a race they didn't even know they were in. As Scott wrote to his wife, quote, I don't know what to think of Amundsen's chances. You can rely on my not saying or doing anything foolish, only I'm afraid you must be prepared for finding our venture much belittled. After all, it is the work that counts, not the applause that follows. Oh, were they talking all kinds of shit to each other too? That'd be yeah. great. I feel like either the, these two parties are like gonna fight or party. I think they're gonna fight. So how did Amundsen manage to organize this expedition without anyone in Scott's expedition knowing? A few years prior, in November of 1908, Amundsen announced to the Norwegian Geographical Society that he was planning a new expedition to be the first person to reach the North Pole, huh? Yeah, that's right. All this concern about the South Pole when no one had even been to the North Pole yet. As Amundsen was preparing to stand atop the globe, news broke that Frederick Cook, an old crewmate of Amundsen's on the Belgica, had made it to the North Pole. Days later, American Robert Peary claimed Cook was a fraud, and it was he who had made it to Santa's hometown. To this day, both claims are debated. But Amundsen didn't care about the details. His dream of being the first to reach the North Pole was thwarted. Nevertheless, the arrangements had already been made, and so on June 7, 1910, Amundsen and a crew of 19 men left Svartskog on a boat borrowed from his childhood hero, Fritjof Nansen. Friends and family waved Norwegian flags at the departing boat. On board, though, Amundsen had a dirty little secret. Oh! What was his dirty little secret? A. They were actually sailing to Antarctica. B. Amundsen had secretly succeeded in training polar bears to haul sledges, and one was in the hull. Or C. He would be picking up a whole second crew in southern Africa. Okay. Ryan, did you wear stripes earlier this season? I think I might have, but it was a long sleeve shirt. It's a stripy season for you, huh? It is a stripy season. <laughs> you look like a mime. Thank you. You look like a fucking mime. Yep. Yeah. Oh. He's drink. Well. Yeah. All right. Oh. Oh, you, you, you broke the glass. In your, in, you got you broke glass it in your hand. It out. Oh, now eat it. Yeah. Chew it. Swallow it. <laughs> oh, impressive! Whoa! Really nicely done. Wow. <clears throat> okay. I'm gonna put A for Antarctica because I, I don't. I'm at a loss here. A. Well, that's gonna be jelly beans for both of you. Hooray! Yes, Amundsen's crew and boat arrangements had been made with the intention of going to the North Pole, but. Amundsen changed his intended target without telling anyone on board. As he later wrote, quote, 
It may possibly appear to many people that I was running a pretty big risk in thus putting off till the last moment the duty of informing my comrades of the very considerable detour we were to make. Suppose some of them, or perhaps all, had objected. <laughs> it must be admitted that it was a great risk, but there were so many risks that had to be taken at that time. Basically, YOLO! So is he the captain? He is the captain. It's interesting people's like devotion to like the captain and the devotion to like the hierarchy and oh, stuff. Oh, captain, where my it's captain, like, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly, where they're like, he could do something as shitty as that and you just be like, I guess we gotta go, we gotta, you know. Unless you have a little mutiny. Oh, I think delicious. this would be the ultimate test of that loyalty. On January 14th, 1911, about a week after Scott's crew had arrived, Amundsen landed in the Bay of Wales, Antarctica, and began setting up camp. As he and his companions set up resupply depots for their eventual push to the pole, Amundsen wrote about his confusion surrounding Scott's decisions. His location was far superior to the Englishman's, and as for dogs, Amundsen wrote, quote, Do not understand what the English mean when they say they cannot use dogs here. There are no better draft animals under these circumstances. Yeah, I mean, so this guy's gotta be laughing, seeing the horses. He's like, look at these fucking guys. <laughs> well, because Norway, it's like, they're used to this sort of similar environment. I'm pretty sure a husky is a uh, president of Norway as far as... <laughs> <laughs> so it makes sense. I feel bad for the horses. Yeah, you should. Yeah, I, I got a feeling what's coming. With both groups resupply caches in position, the men settled into their respective winter camps. The trek to the pole would start when the sun returned in the summer, a round trip journey that would be the same as going from New York to Wyoming. Wow. It is long. That's long. All right, with our two outfits waiting at the starting line, we've got time to get a good look at the teams and pick our sides. Racing on behalf of King George V and the British Empire, Robert Falcon Scott. Scott has two motorized sledges and nine of his original 19 ponies left, two of the lost horses having been eaten by what must have been very confused killer whales. <laughs> oh my God. That's true. That's crazy. That's not a joke. You think he probably after that was like, hmm, a spy, mm, That's right. Give what a fine left. delicacy. Mm. He's got a taste for horse now. <laughs> Bigger bones than he's ever had. Certainly. I was about to say, and a penguin's nice and fatty, so it's probably delicious. Yeah. A horse is very muscular and gamey. It probably was like, yeah. <laughs> I just spit that shit back onto the just boat. Imagine. Thing sucks. Send it back. A mangled, chewed horse corpse rocketing out of the water. <laughs> For clothing, Scott and his men are outfitted with wool underwear and a windproof outer layer. 90 miles closer, racing for King Hakan VII and the proud populace of Norway, we have Roald Amundsen. Amundsen's crew will be carried on seven sleds by 84 dogs wearing loose furs in the Inuit style. Oh, all right, for a jelly bean, who do you think's gonna be the first to the pole? Oh, he certainly seems more prepared. My money's on that guy, yeah, for I think sure. I'm, I'm, I like the underdog, but, you know, it seems like a no-brainer here. Yeah. As they waited, one of Amundsen's crew wrote what everyone was thinking. If you were not the first at the South Pole, you might just as well just stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. On September 8th, 1911, with the thermostat touching a balmy negative 38 degrees Celsius, Amundsen set off with eight men pulled by 84 dogs. Three days later, as the temperature dropped below negative 55 degrees Celsius, the alcohol in their compasses froze. On September 14th, they reached their first supply depot. But with frostbite setting in already, the men decided to leave the equipment and turn back. Amundsen was heartbroken. How did they not all immediately get frostbite in like 15 minutes? Well, I mean, they're, look, they're bundled up, but uh, yeah. I mean, your face is still somewhat exposed. The face, yeah, you have your the eyeballs. Yeah, 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 do the eyeballs not just I freeze? was about to wonder, at what temperature do your eyeballs well, freeze? They probably got some nice goggles or something. They had, oh, surely they had goggles then. It's the early 1900s, they had goggles. They got goggles. They had. It's because they definitely wore goggles in Downton Abbey. Yeah, they they got, these guys were probably steampunk as fuck. You know? <laughs> yeah, sure they were. Those men, however, were furious. Back at camp on September 17th, Amundsen wrote, quote, At the dinner table, I asked each individual what he thought of my actions. There was only one opinion that I had acted correctly. This was a sad end to our excellent unity. Dissension was starting to seep in. And the guy who said that was like a guy who they hated. Oh, yeah. oh no, Captain. I, 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 think I think you did a great, great real good decision making. Shut up, Bob. Fucking Bob. That's such a His loser. ass, Bob. 70 miles to the north, Robert Scott waited until November 1st to set off, hoping the improved weather would aid his ponies in their trek. Unfortunately, even with the improved conditions, the ponies kept sinking up to their bellies, and before long, they were, uh, converted into rations. 
Yikes. No. Yowza. Yeah. Nice way to put it, though. And then the others were whale food. Each man now had to lug 200 pounds through the damp snow, and many of the men began to be affected by snow blindness, which you may recall from that old Donner Party episode meant their eyes were literally sunburnt. Yikes. Yikes. I'm freaking tired. Like, I'm so tired hearing this. Like, I never heard of anything that I want to do less. You know, fun to go on an adventure, but not fun to have sunburnt eyeballs. Not really worth it, though, for what essentially boils down to, like, a bar story. Like, oh, yeah, I went to the South Pole. It was cold. There's not much to see. Like, other places you explore is, like, find, like, some cool stuff or nature. This is just, like, it's snow. Maybe I'm just not an adventurous guy, though. I've never understood things like this, like people who want to climb Everest. I don't get that either. No thanks. Mm. Sometimes when I fall on my snowboard, getting back up is really fucking hard. Like, I get sweaty. Well, that's concerning. Wah. As Scott's expedition progressed, his men kept growing weaker and losing more weight. The clothes lacked ventilation, causing their sweat to freeze inside their jackets. Support groups were periodically sent back to the base camp until only four men remained for the final push. By January 16th, the group was only covering five to seven miles a day, but they could sense that they were getting close. And with no signs of the Norwegian team, spirits were high. Suddenly, one of the four men, Bertie Bowers, called out. Wait, we're getting close. Did they see a little stripy pole in the distance? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> they're, they're doing cartography stuff. I almost feel like it'd be better to just die out there because then there's like an air of mystery. Yeah. Yeah, rather than come back and be like faced with shame. I right. prefer, I prefer living. Yeah, yeah. But if you had to go, you would love to freeze to death. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to freeze to death. Provided that I froze in a funny position. Yeah. Let's, let's uh, freeze you real quick. Let's see. Let's see. Nice. Okay. I want to be like, I want to be like Rodin, like. Great. This, okay, very nice. Yeah. Oh, what did Bertie Bowers have to say that was so important? A, Amundsen was only a mile behind them. B, there was an odd black spot on the horizon. Or C, he was about to die. Or D, iceberg ahead. Or C, life farted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good too. <laughs> Are we locked in? Yeah. All right, what you got? Yeah, hey, we're not alone. I'm gonna say, be the black spot. Oh, the black spot, very Where's scary. You? Hey, would you guys like to find out via the magic of theater? If we must. Yeah, hey. okay, I'll be right back, bye. <laughs> Oh, this sucks. This sucks so bad. <laughs> oh, chin up, birdie, you old bird. We're on the forefront of man's knowledge of nature. We're mere hours away from being the first men to set foot at the South Pole. I mean, right, I, I guess that'll be cool and all. I just, uh, hey, uh, Bobby, we're the only people who have been down here, right? Oh, my dear birdie, you really are losing it. <laughs> of course it's only us. And the only thing around here is ice, right? Blinding white ice. <laughs> God's own blank canvas, pure as the driven snow, because that's exactly what it is. Right, and what's that black spot up there ahead of us? Where? Oh, that? Why, that's a... Why, that looks to be a flag. Which would mean... Oh, which would mean we're not the first to the pole. Oh, shoot. Oh, my God, what a twist. What a twist. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> a jelly bean for oh. Sarah! Yay! Yes, as Scott wrote that night, quote, This told us the whole story. The Norwegians have forestalled us and are first at the pole. It is a terrible disappointment, and I am very sorry for my loyal companions. Tomorrow, we must march on the pole and then hasten home with all the speed we can compass. All the daydreams must go. It will be a wearisome return. I love this journal entries just like... Fuck. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I beefed it. <laughs> yeah. Beefed it hard this time, Scott. My B, guys, my B. <laughs> While Scott wrote about how tough the return would be, Amundsen was already most of the way through his. So how'd that crazy Norwegian end up first at the pole anyway? Well, let's backtrack a bit. After his first failed attempt, Amundsen waited for more than a month until October 20th to start again. Since they had already been through the first part of their journey, the beginning went swimmingly. By December 8th, they passed 88 degrees in 23 minutes. Until then, the furthest south anyone had been. And on December 14th, Roald Amundsen and his four companions became the first people to make it to the South Pole. The next few days, the men trekked about, taking measurements. As Amundsen wrote, 
Here we are at the South Pole, an extremely flat snow plain, almost nothing uneven to see. The sun passes around the sky at practically the same height to shine and warm from a cloudless sky. It's quiet tonight and so peaceful. The dogs are all stretched out in the sun to enjoy, despite the slight hustle and bustle. Apparently, life is pretty good. I'd pay anything to just see the moment when, <laughs> after it wore off that they got there, they were like, yeah, we got here, we're the first. All right. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like he's like feet up, hands back. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's like, having a great time. Mm -hmm, this is the life, guys. Flat snow plane. Hell yeah. He's like, nice and sunny. The dogs are loving it. He's trying to sell it to the rest of his team. He literally says, apparently life is pretty good. You know, I'm thinking of this through the lens of Ryan, because if I got there and it was just like a flat surface, I'd be like, uh, what, should we do fucking snow angels or, so or yeah. something? Yeah. On December 18th, almost a full month before Scott and his crew would even arrive, Amundsen and his crew prepared to leave, setting up a small tent as a monument. Inside, Amundsen left behind his, quote, sextant with horizon glass, a hypsometer, three reindeer skin foot bags, some comics and mittens, and incidentally, some trifles. In addition to that pile of equipment and clothing, Amundsen left two letters, one addressed to the King of Norway and the other addressed to one Robert Falcon Scott. Oh my God, I want to read that letter so That's bad. That's probably very petty, very, very petty. Listen, I don't know everything about this guy, uh, but I feel like he's going to be hes going to be humble. You know, they had, the, they had a lot in common. They both want to reach the South Pole. He probably knows his struggle. He's probably the only person who knows Game lines. recognizes yeah. game. Game, game recognizes recognize game. game, exactly. If they had left a little later, they might pass each other in the snow and all give each other high fives, you know? It's possible. Good game, yeah. good game. You know. Nice hustle. Maybe yeah. he was gracious in victory. So, that's a point for you both for guessing that Amundsen would get there first. Nice. Grats. On January 17th, 1912, Captain Scott read a letter left for him on the bottom of the planet. Dear Captain Scott, as you are probably the first to reach this area after us, I will ask you kindly forward this letter to King Hakan VII. If you can use any of the articles left in the tent, please do not hesitate to do so. With kind regards, I wish you a safe return. Yours truly, Roald Amundsen. It's kinda, it's, it's like saying congratulations, but it's kinda, it's, it's kinda like, hey, you got here too, huh? Wow, Yeah. you finally got here, huh? Be my little delivery boy. Hold on boy. to my pocket. <laughs> Hold on to my pocket. Understandably, this was a blow to the Brits' morale. Scott left a note of his own in the Norwegian's tent to confirm they'd made it. Quote, we built a cairn, put up our poor slighted Union Jack, and photographed ourselves. Mighty cold work, all of it. In his own journal, Scott was only slightly more candid, writing, Great God, this is an awful place, and terrible enough for us to have labored to it without the reward of priority. Maybe this guy shouldn't be an adventurer. Yeah, it's I don't like think so. it's sort of like, you know, I feel like for some people it's like, you know, the journey is the the prize. Yeah. I think clearly if you're willing to endanger this many lives, you're clearly in it for the glory, not for yeah. like, I'm gonna feed my adventurous spirit. The next day, the team started their long, bitter trek back. Frostbite and hypothermia were starting to set in. By February 16th, one of Scott's men had fallen behind. He was found on his knees, clothing in disarray, hands bare and irreparably frosted. Shortly after midnight, he died. On March 5th, another of Scott's men left their shelter in his socks. As Scott wrote, quote, We knew that poor Oates was walking to his death, but though we tried to dissuade him, we knew it was the act of a brave man and an English gentleman. Sure. Maybe he just he went out really quickly to take out the trash. Thought he could get back into the tent in time. And Oh yeah, maybe he had to pee really bad. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'll do this. No need to put on my shoes. I'll be out there in a second. Yeah. Oh, my feet are frozen. Must have been tough to, to poop and pee out there, huh? <laughs> you know what's tough? To, to freeze to death and get second place. Oh yeah, you would not want to be pooping and peeing out there, definitely. Yeah. By the end of March, the surviving members of the party could see the writing on the wall. In one of his final journal entries, Scott wrote, quote, had we lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. He this, died? This bitch died? Yeah, well, Scott's last entry was made March 29th, 1912, but it would not be read until November 12th, when the tent with the bodies of the last remaining men was found. Rip to those men! I can't believe he died out there. He died. Damn, dude. Yeah. That's a tough way for a falcon to go. Born a falcon, died a frozen turkey. 
I guess the moral of the story is, even if you have a cool name, that doesn't mean you can do anything. That's right. On March 8th, 1912, while Scott was mere weeks away from a frozen death, Amundsen reached Australia with news that he had won the race he forced Scott into. He immediately began touring the lecture circuit, though not everyone was a fan, viewing Amundsen's secrecy at the outset as unsportsmanlike. I think it definitely is, but it's also like, he would have died anyway, I think. Yeah, he didn't have the equipment or the personnel to make this a successful journey regardless, so. It's not like Amundsen was like putting oil on the tracks or like, you yeah. know, putting out some nails. Yeah, anything. throwing out some like, banana peels or funny. something for his yeah. horses to slip on. <laughs> for almost a year, Amundsen toured with no knowledge of Scott's fate. Finally, on February 10th, 1913, news reached the world that Scott too had made it to the South Pole, but had died on the return trip. Scott was immediately heralded as a hero, and the public kickstarted what would be over $6 million today for his widow and son. For the rest of his life, Amundsen was deeply upset by the fact that Scott hadn't made it back from the pole probably regretting the dick letter he'd left a doomed man. <laughs> Amundsen would eventually make it to the North Pole as well, becoming the first to reach both. Amundsen's reputation remained stained until the 1960s when Scott's family published the captain's journals, showing the public that, uh, well, frankly, Scott was uh, pretty bad at his job. Apart from the mistakes with the motorized sledges and ponies, Scott hadn't planned for the amount of calories he and his men would burn, and had outfitted the expedition with the wrong kind of clothing. In short, he was doomed from the outset. He beefed it on every level. Yeah. He was like, what do we need, uh, flip-flops? Uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously. He spent so long making snowshoes for horses, yeah. Yeah. he forgot to pack uh, some, some salt pork. Don't forget to pack a cardigan. <laughs> uh, here that? it's gonna be pretty chilly down there. Shut up, I'm working on these horses. These horse <laughs> shoes. And how did things turn out for Amundsen? Well, in June of 1928, he set out to attempt and rescue a plane that had crashed in the North Pole. And he never returned. His body was never recovered, finally claimed by the ice he'd spent his entire life conquering. This happens a lot. Poetic. Yeah, kind of a noble end. That's kind of how they want to go, so, you know. Yeah, do you think as he was freezing to death, he was like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe. He was <laughs> well, like, he was honestly, like, this kind of kicks ass. Part of me is like, exploration's cool, and I think it's important, but I also am like, too much free time. It's fun to race. Fun to race. You know, until it's not. Well, that concludes our history lesson. After our dutiful scorekeeper finishes up her tabulations, we'll find out who earns the coveted cap and title of History Wizard. But in the meantime, enjoy this special performance from the continent of Antarctica. Whoa! Wow, that's wow. really cool. Wow, they got the continent of Antarctica. It's a big get. I've added a little, I hope, to the knowledge gleaned by Captain Cook, Sir James Ross, and other explorers before me. But I've only touched the fringe of things. Way down at the bottom of the world, there's a desert where the penguins roam. The breeze sweeps across the icy sheets, it's a lonely place to call your home. In frigid air, the Arctic air sits and listens to the orca's cries. Charcoal-winged albatross float flecked across the cobalt sky And I don't need any more than what I got And won't you please send my regards to Captain Scott Cause he stepped foot upon my shores And before long he was no more It's a drag-out race to the bottom of the world I hope he found what he was looking for. The whole continent, vast, mysterious, inhospitable, and still to all intents and purposes, unknown. Should pitch southwesterly swell, birds on the starboard hand. Keen eyes shielding blinding skies, fixed upon the looming land. Slip swift past the crozier cliffs, wondering what glory awaits. Boots down on the burwart crown, the slow and steady pull of fate. I don't need any more what I got. And won't you please send my regards to Captain Scott? Cause he stepped foot upon my shoulders And before long he 
was no more It's a drag out race to the bottom of the world I hope he found what he was looking Forty pounds of biscuits and his coal to burn Oh, he's getting buckish, think they might have worms We've been cutting through and getting stuck in your bones And you never ever felt so far away from all Digging out the sledges when the sun comes up Trudging into nothing on a pemmican gut Ponies having trouble jumping floor to floor And you never ever felt so far away from all To Captain Robert Falconstein Cause he stepped foot upon my shores And before long he was no more It's a drag out race to the bottom of the world I hope he found what he was looking for Captain, this Antarctic of yours is a cold, cool place That was really moving. Yeah. It was really kind of somber and touching. I'm so sad it's the last song of the season. I can't believe it. Wow, that was really good. Whoa! Oh my god. Aww. What a chillingly spectacular number. <laughs> All right, it's time to wrap this up. Uh, hey, Ma, according to your tabulations, who receives the coveted cap and title of History Wizard? I can't believe it's already the season finale. I know, what a chill season. Eh, well, after all that commotion last year, I think we all deserve a little peace and quiet for a change. Peril is compelling, but also pretty exhausting. That's true, that's true. Eh, well, hey, it's not like nothing happened. I mean, your mother got a degree in math, and I'm the ping on Doom 2. Uh, then he's got me flying out to Abu Dhabi on Monday. <laughs> wow. wow! Wow, cool. That's crazy. Well, congrats to you both, man. It's so weird, this is usually the point where a false sense of security gives way to some shocking turn of events. That's true. That is, that's, that's true. Anyway, who won? Sarah! Yay! Congratulations, Sarah! Come collect your coveted cap, which you have so rightly oh. earned. Thank you. In your face. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, could have been gracious. And, and there's one for, History, was there? oh. Mom made one for Beef Boy, too. Oh, you get a hat, too. Oh, look, the look letters are finally back. Well, you're a big Beef Boy, and you deserve that. Oh, I'll just, you know what, I'm just gonna, I was gonna put it over the beanie, but it didn't fit. That would've oh, been cool. this looks so great on you guys. Well, look, I think that about wraps it up. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Ryan, thanks for being a friend. And to all of you at home, thanks for watching Puppet History, where the details are always a little fuzzy. We'll see you next oh. season. Deuces, <laughs> woo! 40 pounds of biscuits and there's coal to burn. Ponies getting buckish, think they might have worms. Been cutting through, getting stuck in your bones, and you never ever felt so far away from home.